Uh, so hello everybody, it's been a great conference until now, I, ho I hope I will not spoil this experience. I will be talking about Liberator. Um, free your data with RC2616, I suppose most of you know which RC this is. So it's the HTTP 1.0 specification, and it's about liberating all the data. Um, what is Liberator? It's a closure library, it's not a web framework or a uh, uh, a bigger thing, it's a library to implement REST resources um, oh, um, on the server side. So let's start simple. What is HTTP actually? HTTP is a huge specification. It has request and response, headers and body, methods, status codes, content negotiation, conditional requests, and even more. And that's only HTTP 1.0. There's out HTTP 1.1, which is most will use at the moment, or even Speedy, which will, like, will be incorporated into HTTP BIS, which is uh, in the working group at the moment. So let's start with methods. The core specification has eight methods, which are, I think most of you will know, an RC2616, get, put, post, delete, head, options, trace, and connect. I suppose many of you will never have heard about trace and connect, uh, connect method. And um, at a regular uh, web project, you mostly care about get, put, post, and delete. So then there's even one more, which is patch, which is rather um, coming up in the, in the last years, I think, when we talk about uh, REST API stuff. Um, currently, Liberator has some undergoing uh, planning how to support patch. And there's, for example, even more web stuff, add some methods, and um, that are seven, for example. So HTTP is a whole like ecosphere of uh, protocols, actually. So we have header fields in HTTP. Um, so my clicker needs some multiple clicks, um, which are 47. I guess nobody would be able to like enumerate them uh, from the head. Uh, me neither. So it's except until www-authenticate. Then we have status codes, which fall into several like classes, which are five classes of status codes. Um, the 100 ones are informational status codes. Then we have success uh, to signal success, redirection, client errors, and even server errors. When you're a good citizen within the HTTP environment, then you make use of these error codes and not like uh, stuff in an exception into the body and return it as a JSON containing like a, a custom made up error code. You use something like uh, 403 forbidden or 404 not found. Whew. So there are 41 status codes in total only for HTTP 1.0. Then there come web stuff, an additional status code, which is 422 unprocessable entity, I think, which is very useful because um, it fills a gap in the original specification. Liberator actually, actually supports it. And there's, for example, the HTCPCP protocol, which is the Hypertext Coffee Pot Control Protocol. And it adds another status code, um, I'm a teapot. <laughs> Nothing you will be using in your next project, I suggest. Um, so let's go on. We have 41 status codes. When we want to make use of all of the status codes, we must make a lot of decisions. When you, when you think about a binary tree of decisions, we need like two to power six decisions. Um, and when we cut some, some branches down, we still need like 40 branching points. So it's a lot of work. But in general, we will, won't, you won't need to like, use every status code in your project. So let's look at how we could implement this like, full HTTP specification. Um, Liberator sits on top of the ring specification, which uh, I think is the most common specification to build web applications in Clojure. And it's basically uh, a ring handler as a function that transforms uh, Oh, I have a laser pointer. Nobody can see this, but I have a lot of fun. Um, which transforms a request method map, or a request map, which conta consta contains, for example, a request method, headers, bodies, to a response map, which uh, consists of a status code, a header, which is itself a map, and some kind of body representation. 
It's actually a bad wording because in HTTP we don't talk. <laughs> yes, technically it's a body, but we all, always talk about representation. So you have like, some kind of octet stream which uh, represent the requested resource or which encodes the entity that uh, transferred over the wire within a post request. But mm, most people talk uh, or call this a body, which is fine. So um, we have like a basic structure, which means we thread the request method somewhere in some way through a function, which is a ring handler. So we have ring handler map, and we re get the map with the status or the response returned. Oh, I have some highlighting. No, no way to use. So, um, when we think about how, how to implement this decision tree to make use of all the status codes, we must fill something here at the red uh, question marks, which maybe will look a little bit like this, uh, a list of cons, where, or some if-else structure, or when structure, or if-let, and like that, to return all of those different status codes. Um, I don't know what, what these are at the moment, for example. So I think 4.3 would be uh, forbidden or like that. Um, Let's go on and try how this should look like. So we, ha we have to make a decision at some point whether to re return this particular status code, like 503 or 501, or not. So we have another set of question marks here which we need to fill in. So let's start simple. We have a handler which returns a static response, which is 200, everything's well, and the body is uh, an event, whatever. Uh, my Toy domain, I will play in the demo part of the presentation later, will be about events or talks or, or schedules or whatever. So I took the data from the user, Euro closure conference schedule. Uh, so we talk about the event, an event, and we must check that the client actually uses uh, the correct request method. So, so in this case, we first check whether the method is get, and uh, if yes, return status 200, and if not, we return 405 method not allowed, then we would have to check whether the session or talk exists. If not, we would have to return 404, uh, else we would be able to return 200 and like a print string the session data. Then we will go on and add some more content uh, representations, for example, application closure and text HTML. Uh, if not, we need to return 406 if the requested media type is not available. We can add some uh, conditional requests like uh, checking for, oh, what is this, last modification date. And I think it gets worse. No, I stopped here. So what you can see is we have like a, a whole tree of binary decisions which are encoded in if and if let here. And uh, out for, outfalls of this decision thing uh, a bunch of stuff which is mostly the status codes and maybe some, some uh, media type in the response, for example, character sets and all of that. And that does not show like it would be very much of fun to do it on a daily basis and um, you would have to repeat all this for every resource in some way. And that's annoying. And what we want to do is we want to liberate all the data and not care about all this if-else stuff. So liberator is basically the extracted decision flow that we have seen here, but more complete to reach all of the, those 47 uh, status codes. So I have a visualization in background. It's so, such a large diagram that I show only, a, only a, a certain part of it or even more. And what you can see at the lower part, we finally end at some some location where we generate a response with different uh, status codes, and I color-coded it. The yellow ones are the redirection status codes. The green ones are successful status codes. So that's how Liberator <laughs> looks like, or the decision flow looks like, in an abstract way. But it's not very useful for closure programmers, so I have prepared a little demo. I will switch uh, to Emacs here and start at the beginning. Uh, I have some, like, a boilerplate here. I will do it full screen. I think everybody can see this. Um, and some Emacs magic going on, so it can jump around. So I will declare some, some stuff. This is basic common setup to start a jetty uh, web server, and I have a top-level bar, which um, 
which will contain our um, demo handler, which I will call event because it encodes like a better would have called it talk because it encodes a resource uh, representation of a single talk at the conference. And I use a little bit of middleware with the wrap params to be able uh, to have a simple access to the query parameters later on. So the most basic event we can create is by using the resource function, which uh, returns a ring handler. So now you can guess what would be a reasonable default implementation, um, but there's no single truth. So Liberator uh, has, has a default implementation. We can try it out. I have a Safari instance here. Oh, I, I'm, I'm cheating. So I, I do not need an idea because we do not processing here. So the default response is somewhat unexpected to most of you, I think, which is no acceptable resource available because we did not define which kind of uh, media type our resource is able to, to produce. And the web browser, I think it will request like any resource, but we have no idea. Uh, and under the hood, this is, uh, has a correct status code. I will start up the debugging. <laughs> I like to start up the debugging extension. I don't know why it doesn't work. So we can fall back. It's the same at the last uh, time at Euroclosure I did the talk. It also failed to show up with the debugging extension. Um, so we do a basic, basic web request to our resource, and a dash E means include all the header stuff. So we can see the status code returned is for six not acceptable, which means that the requested media type is not available or not acceptable. So that's pretty boring, I guess. So Let's continue here. And so we declare that available media types uh, are text HTML. You can pass a sequence. And wow, we have an answer. It's still boring, but the default value you get, we will receive for 200 status will be OK. So you have like a little bit of things. Um, we can also make this a little more compact when we compare it with this. Um, we have like a definition and a resource which generates a function, and we have a convenience macro which is def resource uh, to make things a little more, more shorter and compact. We can further proceed and uh, add actually some representation for our requested resource. Here I implement a handler for the OK status, that's for HTTP 200, and return a constant string, and as you expect, that, uh, we have a, the exact same value uh, returned to the browser. Or we can use uh, a function to declare uh, a value at one of those handler points, and this function will be called and evaluated at runtime, so we could uh, return different representations uh, depending on some parameters. For example, in this context, we can we can look up the request parameters. So in Liberator, every decision callback and handler callback here receives a single parameter, which is the context map. And within the context map, you have at the key request, the original web request, and we can dig down until we have like the parameter ID. We use this to call a function find talk, which is like an in-memory lookup of a list of, of data and return this data. This actually returns a closure map, the find talk um, function call. And now see what happens when we request like a certain talk. I guess I'll use number, number 10. Oh, nothing happens. Okay, I have to evaluate this first. So we have an HTML representation of the data. When we look at the source code of this, I hope this notice, oh, so it works. You can see that this is actually HTML, but we have not specified HTML representation for the data uh, in our resource definition. This is one of the, of the things where uh, Liberator is like batteries included, because we have a default way to do default representations for, all, for a handful of uh, media types, for example, text, H a text HTML, application Eden, um, clo uh, JSON and even text CSV for some kind of data structure. So I will make this a little, sm a little smaller. But what happens if we request like talk with the ID 1000? 
Um, as you can guess, there were less than 1,000 sessions at user closure last month. So we receive like an empty document. The HTML that you can see here, I think, is like made up by by some plugin in Safari at this at this time. So let's look at the at the wire level. I have some zooming capabilities here. So, oh, that looks a little wrong. Because can you see it? What's the status code? 200 and 200 means okay. A way better status code would be uh, 404 actually because the resource doesn't exist. So um, what we can do now is like implement this, implement this in our demo code. And we have an exists callback. And the exists callback is required as, uh, to return a binary value, true or false. And if it's true, the processing proceeds. And if it's false, we la land up at uh, a 404 representation. And the handle OK thing remains the same. In the exist call, we simply ask our in-memory database whether the talk for this um, ID exists. And as you would expect, oh, we have even a default representation, a nice message, resource not found. And when you look here at the, at the status code in the lower pane, you can see that it's uh, 404. So that sounds not too bad. Um, but when you look at the code, you can see that we have some repetition. And repetition is bad. We know all know this. Um, we could use like a helper function, extract this, but in this case, the function would be called twice. So we have some problems with data consistency or even performance. So what we can do now is that we do not return simply a Boolean value. I will highlight this here. Uh, but we can also return a pair, which is encoded as a vector. The first value will be taken as a binary decision outcome of the decision function, binary value, and the second uh, part or second element in the vector will be the new context. So I can update the context and threads uh, state uh, through the processing from one decision point to the next one. And when you look at the handle OK function, we can simply, instead of um, invoking our, our uh, database call, again, extract the value from the context. This is like a default pattern, pattern in, uh, in, closure, in, in Liberator, excuse me. Um, and in case of that we want to return a false value, we return a pair with false in the context. But this is rather verbose, and Liberator supports some, some shortcuts on this. For example, in the false case, we can simply return nil. And uh, then the context will not be changed. Or we can simply, when you look at like the last and this last version, and this version, we can simply drop the nil because we have nil with default to nil for the, nil for the else part. Or we can even return a map which just contains data which is as a default merge to the context. So that is like the basic pattern you use in Liberator to, to extract some, some data and to pass it on. And if you're smart, which was not my idea, to be honest, then you recognize a, that a closure keyword is even a function. So you can use the, the keyword directly as, as a handler function. So that's nice. What we can, we can improve a little more using destructuring and like that, make things more uh, concise. And we can add more functionality. For example, more media types. So in this case, I declare that my, my, my resource should also be available in text HTML, application JSON, and application Eden. And to make things more visible, I use uh, like the command line. And I will, in this case, request um, JSON. It's a funny sign. Um, not acceptable. Okay, I had to, to uh, evaluate first. Still not acceptable. Oh, that, that's not good. Um, what should we do now? I think retry is a good option. No error. Accept. Okay, now we have a nice JSON representation of the data. Or we can request Eden, for example which looks a little bit the same. 
and which is Eden. And what you also can see is that we have a content type header generated, uh, added um, a character set. This is all those things that Liberator does for us. And if you're a little bit into web, um, web development and conditional requests, you know that you na need to uh, add this header to enable the client to tell apart different versions of, uh, of, the, of the resource when only like the representation changes, for example, the encoding, the media type, or uh, the language. It's easy to forget on like confuses caches and, and even the browser cache a lot. So let's see what we can do also. We can add more handlers. For example, in the case that, the, that we request now an, an application type which is not available. We have a very boring default answer, which is no acceptable resource available. And you, when you want to do like hypermedia, you want to guide the client to a possible next stage. So it would be nice when we could return a list of available media types to make life easier for a developer or a, or a user. So we can implement a handler for the case not acceptable. In this case, we simply will return a string representation uh, containing all the available uh, media types, we can even improve on this, but uh, um, I have like not so much time. So in this case, available media types will be returned as a message, and this is a custom handler implementation. So conditional requests. Um, to leverage brow uh, browser caching, we need to specify, for example, last time the resource representation changed. So if you come back to the web page and request the same uh, URL again, then you have the chance, if the server representation did not change, that you will not um, fetch the whole page again, but simply um, receive a three or four not modified. Uh, I made up some automatic change functions, rounds down to the last minute, I think. And I added another declaration here. The last modified time when the resource was last modified is simply this, this function. So, I hope it, it works, uh, works in Safari as well. So as you can see, I will make this a little, little bigger. When we load the resource, we have status code 200, and I hope it did not change already. OK, you can see we requested the same resource again. It did not change on the server side, and the server simply returned 304, and the request size was only like 226 bytes. Uh, basically, there's no body. Contained. So when we wait some time, I hope it's, hope it's enough. Still, three or four. OK, now the resource changed, the representation changed. For example, another process would have updated your database row or like that. Then the server returns 200, and the client would fetch the whole representation again. This, this is how um, HTTP caching works, basically. And there's another mechanism, which is eTag, which is like rep returning a more of a, of a fingerprint of the resource of re representation. As you know, um, depending on timestamps, it's a little, little fragile because you need to make sure that your client and server have a common understanding of time, time uh, or are like in sync. And when you use fingerprinting, even if the resource changes back to an older state and your client happens to have exactly this state cached, uh, it would not need to fetch it uh, again. So this works basically the same. I will not show it to you. So what we have also, and this is a very helpful and great feature, um, we have some way to debug the execution flow. Um, when I forget to reload, I had an unexpected status code returned uh, like three or four uh, slides ago. And um, in this case, reloading helped, but mm, from, from time to time, you need to have a more detailed view into your system, especially when we talk about more complicated processing, like for post requests or put requests and like that. And Liberator supports a debugging console. So when I do this request again and uh, dig into it, I will have over here somewhere a very weird looking header, which is a link header, uh, which contains like a relative, relative URL part, which I could use to, which I can resolve actually, but I will cheat here and just go directly to it because I do not want to, to file and use this link. And here I have like a list 
I had a list of, of the latest Liberator requests, and this is the um, debugging view for this uh, request we made just uh, 25 seconds ago containing the headers and the trace about all the decisions that have been taken and the outcome of the decision. Sometimes it's a Boolean value. In this case, I think it's a, a default uh, value. And here I have the update, updated representation during content negotiation, all those uh, stuff. Here I have, uh, as the outcome of the exists handler, the actual um, closure data that we use to build up the representation. And here below, this is a nice part, we have a graph, which is highlighted uh, <laughs> dynamically. <laughs> yes, I, I will zoom in. I will zoom in. So, uh, oh, uh, OK, we have some screen size resolution thing here. And I think also uh, with um, Safari. Oh, this zooms better. OK, I have to do the, the pinch or whatever gesture. So. You can see method allowed, authorized, allowed, valid content header, the thing that I showed in the background of the slide before. So it's very nice, red, red and green labeling, and it's a, a very helpful tool. Um, so uh, even more fun is that this graph is semi-automatically uh, automatically generated from the source code. So I extract the source code, feed it to some processing, generate a dot file, feed it to graphics, make some SVG, embed it into the browser, and then comes the manual processing part to make it more useful, and having, like, having some dynamic CSS attached to it using JavaScript is a little bit ugly, but it works. So let's return to my them to my slides. This is what we ended up with in the end. We have the available media type declaration, the, the way how to check for existence. Uh, we have a specification how to, how to do the re representation for 200 or key. OK case. We have uh, the declaration how to find out the last modification date and even a, a way to to uh, build up a somewhat bogus uh, e-tag in this case. And this was where we started. And this was, I think, not even complete compared to the other one. So I think it's a, it's a slight improvement. <laughs> so that is what we have now. And I want to analyze this a little bit. So basically, it boils down to this structure. We have a dev resource declaration, and we have a list of declarations for decision points and handlers. We have even more you can check on the, on the web page. And um, it contains, on the right side, as the values, functions. And these functions like declare the essence of your representation or your resource. So this is the essential complexity of the resource implementation. You cannot go without it. Whether you use Perl, Erlang, Ruby, plain ring, or whatever, or Node.js, um, you have to implement this at some point. And this is the essential complexity of our example. So like. It's not too much for, for that what it does, I think. Click, click, click. So I want to talk a little bit of, about Liberator's execution model. So we had seen the context. The context is the state of the computation throughout uh, the whole decision flow. I'm rather, rather um, irritated or confused in some way that I be, will be now the first one who will drop the M word. We have the closure conference, and nobody dared to use the word monad. So it's a little bit like the state monad, but we don't need an enclosure, so forget everything that I said. So the context will be threaded through. And it starts by, by being very simple. It contains, for example, the request. It contains some additional things, but you will like, uh, deal with the request most of the time. Then in existence of callback, we added some, some data to it, whatever uh, it is. During content negotiation, there was filled in the representation map, which contains all those technical details, how to represent the resource data in the end as, a, as, a, as an octet stream. And this is a very, very nice part about Liberator, that it takes care of this. It's not com feature complete, but it's rather good at the moment. 
So this is how a representation looks like. It has a media type, it has some language, it has most text-based media type have a character set, would not make any sense for an, for an image, for example. And we have an encoding, which is, for example, deflate or gzip or like that, um, which we don't care about a lot, I think, uh, on this side of, of the server, because we, we can use li like transparent proxies who do all those uh, on-the-fly gzip thing for us, but it's possible. Okay, oh, I had some highlighting at the edit. Um, how does it work that when we return a data value from our handler function that it ends up as an octet stream? That's a protocol in uh, Liberator which is called representation, contains a single method as response which receives the data here mar marked as x and the context. And we have default implementations uh, which are returned literally. So when you, when you return uh, this kind of data type from your handler function string, file input stream, the first three, then they will use directly as the ring response uh, or as the body of the ring response. But when you return a closure map or sequence uh, like uh, thing, then we have some additional processing. So the first three end up as the body of the ring response and the last two ones have some magic attached to it. And we can represent automatically at the moment Eden, JSON, text plane, HTML, and text CVS, depending on the exact shape of, your, of the returned data. But Eden and JSON is like possible for every data, uh, whatever you return. It's a very neat thing for fast integration of services, so to have a quick way to, to, um, to provide data uh, via HTTP. You can, of course, extend this and do your own implementation. So you can either extend a multi-method which receives or which, is, which dispatches on the negotiated media type and return, for example, a string. In this case, we have an artificial media type foo bar, and it will receive like a map representation, and you extract the, the the color key and return what is supposed to be a string or whatever, and simply concatenate this to a string. And now you are able to render the media type foo bar, given that you return a map of the, of the correct shape from your handler. So this is an example how this would work. We return like this special kind of uh, a special map containing at the key color green, and handler key would be like the keyword function return actually this, this map value, and when the client requests foo bar, all this magic would happen, would happen. I will go back one slide. In the end, you can always return like a string, and this will return literally from your handler, or you can return a byte stream, or in, I think it's an input stream, which will also be returned direct to, directly to ring. A liberator will, all, will add all this um, necessary he header things like content type, and uh, vary and last modified and all this. There are more methods. We also looked at get. Uh, I have, do not have the time to go into details here, but Liberator supports, supports processing of post, put, and get, I think, completely. So we, oh, I think the, this, this was about the, about the ring response thing. I, I think I shuffled the slides uh, around a little bit. I also talked about this. Okay, we can also, as an idea, return Shesire Freshen. I learned about uh, yesterday or the, the day before yesterday. Whatever, iCal, PNG, we can use NLive Hiccup Selma to build up um, HTML representations. But back to this, <laughs> we can, we want to be able to have more methods. For post, there are a, a whole bunch of decision points which you can or must implement, which more or less relate to the status code returned. For put, it's basically the same. They're a little different. The semantics are different between post and put. In the end, you will, at some point, need to read RFC 2616 to be, to be able to implement it, but it's not too hard. It's, I, I think it's uh, rather, rather fun to read this, more fun than look at this academic paper uh, which was presented on, on Wednesday. Okay, may, maybe it would even be the same level of fun, but uh, I could make any sense, uh, uh, some sense out of the HTTP RFC, but not out of this paper. 
So Liberator doesn't live uh, like in its own world. We need some integration. In my example, I use Jetty to do the integration to have like something that connects to the wire. Um, it's a ring handler, or to be to be to be more precise, it's it generates ring handler. So it integrates well with the standard closure web development environment. You can use ring routing libraries like Composure or Cloud. Uh, you can use ring middleware, for example, when you want to use FRAN for authentication or uh, like the reloading stuff or maybe even session handling, which is not very restful, but it's very practical to have like a user sh session and make the user key blocked in and like that. So this is how a typical implementation would, like in some way, uh, would, would look like in some way. You have like two resources defined with Liberator. You have a routing specification, uh, which in the end dispatches to the, to the Liberator functions or Liberator resources. We have some middleware, reducing, and we have your wrap trace, which enables the Liberator uh, tracing and uh, debugging console. So in the future, we want to implement patch, for example. Actually, before the conference, some guy asked me whether I would be at the conch and uh, because he wanted to implement patch. I don't know if, it's, if he's around here. So I guess not. Uh, it's not that. <laughs> Maybe he, he's sitting at his computer right now and implementing patch. Um, I want to be able to do request body processing, which means that when you send a post request containing Eden data or JSON data or even binary data, we have at the moment no support for this in Liberator, which means you can process the body, of course, but we have not a thing which like, resembles the representation generation. So you have to do the dispatch on media type yourself. Um, it's not so bad, but it would be nice to have this easy way to do uh, for example, JSON or Eden parsing, uh, have Liberator do it for you. So I want to be able to enable custom decision flows. What we have at the moment is that the decision flow of HTTP 1.0 is hard-coded, which means I have some uh, funny macro where I can, in the, in the Liberator namespace, declare the, the execution flow for HTTP 1.0. But there are people who want to implement like VETDAF or add, for example, patch as a method. And there's no easy way to extend it at the moment. What I want to do is to like, um, declare the decision flow as a closure data structure. And this could be then maybe using some macro kung fu or uh, some interpreter used to run the decision flow, enable that you manipulate the decision flow itself, and even would uh, enable, as far as I understand, a better integration into Pedestal, which is requested from time to time. I have no idea about this. I know it run, run, that, that is able to run ring handlers, but we do not make any, any advantage uh, out of this, uh, this thing. Um, so, future whatever. Um, I do not know how, where HTTP bis will end, if there will be available more status codes, request handlers. So, this will evolve, I think. So, that's it, and I'm up for questions now. Yeah, please come. So I like that it's declarative, um, but as you reason through that, you have to think through at what point the, the context has been enriched, and is that yes. a step? Are there other projects that do that? I mean, what, are there, is that just something you have to deal with, or is there a better okay. way to so I repeat the question. Um, the question was whether when, you, when we think about the, that Liberator is declarative, you have still no, like, in which order all those decision functions are being processed and how the context flows through the system. The question was if this was, like, an essential property of how to implement web resources or uh, if it was, like, a particular property of Liberator and if there would be another way. So another way would be to use middleware, for example standard ring middleware. There are middleware implementation to do, like, I think, conditional requests, but they fall short when you have, like, multiple uh, endpoints or multiple outcomes. I think it's, it, it's a necessary property. Maybe it gets more, more transparent when we have a more declarative style for the flow itself. So at the moment, when I implement uh, liberator resources, I often look at the diagram, or even at the source code, just to, get, just to know like, the order in which things will be happening. 
in some implementations of REST that you see in other, say, web frameworks, they do some things that are non-standard but useful, like for an HTML request that is a post, uh, you'll get a redirect as the response so that yeah. you're redirected to that. But if yeah. you said it would be a JSON, of course, yes. not. Yeah. Is there support for having that sort of conditional based on media type uh, I don't know what you can what what you can do at the moment. We go back some slides when you have like the po typical post uh, decision points where you can hook in. There is uh, a callback point which is uh, called post redirect. When you return true, then you will uh, end up at the 302, I think. And when you return false, you will end up at uh, like accepted or like that where you can hook in a custom handler to return like a JSON representation. And what is important is that every decision can take a function. So, so you can uh, vary, on, on, vary on the individual use case, whether to run, return true or false. Great. So we have one minute left. One question. Yes. What's the performance cost? I don't know. <laughs> I know. I'm not in the, in the high performance business at the moment, but it's one of the things, the things why I want to have like the decision flow encoded as a, as a data structure. Sure. So you could hook in like a, a compilation step using macros to have a very direct way. At the moment, we have for every decision like a map, look up, and like that. So I don't think it's unreasonably high, but there is some, some, some cost. So when you, I would suggest when you have a high performance thing to look into, maybe look into using plain ring, or maybe just measure it before. So 20 seconds, a fast question. Are your resources accept, uh, accessible as data after definition? Can you go back to the structure? Uh, no, actually return, they return a, a function, uh, a lambda abstraction in some way, but you can simply store the, what, what the dev resource uh, accepts is a map. So you can store the map and manipulate the map and like uh, use a default implementation and just associate some custom things on top of it and use the updated or the enhanced map for the actual uh, dev resource or use, you fall back to the single, simple resource function which accepts uh, like the map and value <laughs> stuff. So that's it, thank you very much. <laughs>